That's just all right. Great. It works. Good evening, everybody. I know everyone here, so this helps. I'll still introduce myself for the people watching at home, though. Uh, my name is Sarah Felice, and I am the curator here at the Lipa Ratner Museum of Art. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight as we welcome Marjorie Greengraff. I have a few words to say about her, um, and then she'll get started, and we can have a little Q&A afterwards. Fabulous. Okay. So Marjorie Greengraff has devoted more than 40 years to art education. Throughout her career, Graf has strived to achieve a high level of quality, integrity, and intensity in her work as an art educator and as a fine artist. We honor her and celebrate her work tonight as a distinguished professor emerita at St. Petersburg College. Born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Graf is a first-generation college student who earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in printmaking from the Philadelphia College of Art. In 1976, she began teaching middle school before earning a Master of Education degree from Tyler School of Art at Temple University. After moving to Florida in 1982, she taught at art centers throughout Pinellas County. In 1997, Graf became a professor at St. Petersburg College and continued to develop her unique style as a fine artist with an emphasis on mark making and a deep devotion to printmaking. Influenced by ancient Japanese woodblock prints, Graf perceives the world through the interaction of color and shapes. Over the course of 21 years, Graf helped develop a thriving printmaking program in the visual arts department at St. Petersburg College's Clearwater campus. Teaching drawing, painting, and printmaking, she has enriched students' experiences through guest dem artist demonstrations, and she has utilized the Lipa Ratner Museum of Arts Galleries and Resource Center as a learning lab. With guidance and encouragement, she has helped students discover and express their individual styles. Along with her colleague and friend, Kim Kirchman, she began the annual student exhibition at SPC, as well as co-curated exhibitions in printmaking and ceramics. Though Graf has since retired from St. Petersburg College, her impact continues to be felt here at the museum and through the lives of her students, colleagues, and collectors of her work. Since her retirement, Mar Marjorie continues on a new path as a working artist, and I look forward to hearing about her recent work tonight with you all. She has become instrumental to the museum's docent team, as well as our Leap into Art Youth program. When I began here at the museum back in April, she was first in line to extend a warm welcome to me. And I have so enjoyed getting to know her these last few months. And I'm eternally grateful for the history and insight that she has so graciously shared with me on the history of art at St. Petersburg College. She says of her teaching philosophy, to marvel is the beginning of knowledge and not to marvel the first step towards ignorance. So said the Greeks. My teaching objectives were many. I wish to share my enthusiasm for the subject I have studied and worked in for over 40 years. I always wanted to instill a desire to learn more in my subject area and to be a role model for my students. Advances in technology, non-toxic medium, safer studios, and a multicultural student body at SPC all encouraged and supported my desire to offer challenging and relevant assignments to my classes. Professionally, I continue to develop my own work Maturity and experience have given me the insights to um, my image making. And yes, I still marvel. It is my absolute honor and pleasure to welcome Marjorie Green Graf. Thank you, Sarah. Well, I feel like I'm speaking to a group of my friends, which I am. So I may modify this a little bit because I know everybody and that's really exciting. But thank you to Sarah, to um, Christine and to Jonathan Barnes who suggested that I be included in the faculty show. I've been in, I guess, every faculty show that's been at the museum, but this is the first time as a professor emerita. So Jim Hagen Buckle and I are really honored to be a part of this group. Um, so I wanna thank all of you for that. Um, I did wanna say something and I did run this by Sarah um, because I think in these times, it's important to remember Abraham Ratner, who's name is on the museum. And we, as docents, learned all these things that we 
um, tell the visitors that Ratner's parents fled Russia because of the pogroms. And he felt like an outsider in Poughkeepsie, New York, because he's one of the few Jewish people in that area. Um, but he was so against war, even though he was in World War I, he did serve in World War I. Um, and I think if he were alive now, his connection to Israel was strong. He went there and made tapestries. And I think if he were alive now, he would be so saddened about everything that is happening, happening between the Palestinians, their poor suffering, the Israeli suffering, and American suffering. Um, you know, I've had to do things that I never thought I'd have to do, like, do I take the mezuzah off my door? You know, nothing that I'd ever thought would be necessary. So it is difficult times, and I think Ratner would have some good words um, if you were. Alive. <clears throat> so I give this talk and sort of honor him at the same time. Um, so I'm going to begin. I always put an artist's picture in all my talks, you know, so we have Bonard's <laughs> picture, Matisse's picture. Um, so this is me at about age two, and I always was an artist. I knew I wanted to be an artist. My mother encouraged it. Um, I just spoke for a minute at the um, group of first generation um, college students, and I am a first generation college student in my family. My parents did not go to college. They sacrificed a lot for my sister and I to get an education. So there I am. I think I was drawing on the walls, which my mother was not happy about, but um, I was drawing even at an early age. When I turned 50, we won't say how long ago that was, but it was a while, <laughs> I gave myself a gift to go to the New York Studio School. And I don't know if you remember this, Kim, I do. but you had to apply. And Jim Hagenbuckle, who is also in the faculty show, wrote me a letter of recommendation, which was really nice. So I packed myself up. I went to New York with all my art supplies and I did a two week drawing marathon. And marathon doesn't begin to describe what went on. We drew from the models and they had multiple models for six or seven hours a day. Then we had critiques that went on till midnight I mean, it was brutal. And then you'd go home, try to get the charcoal off you and start again the next day. But that experience really influenced my work. I was always interested in drawing, but Graham Nixon, who was the um, teacher, and he's still teaching at the New York Studio School, um, he was rough and he really changed my perspective on working and mark making. So some of you or most of you probably know the printmaking process, but I just wanted to explain a little bit of how I make the prints. Um, and it might be helpful for some of the docents here too. Um, a lot of times I'll start with a black and white drawing and um, work out my idea. I did do a lot of work for about 20 years based on Kim and Mark's home on Hidden Lake. So when I was conceiving of this, it was sort of the lake their swimming pool and their fire pit. And I wanted to combine all that into a print. So first I silk screened um, the green and the bright colors was the easiest way to get the colors down. And then I carved a block and printed the black on top of it. So it was a multi-medium process, the silk screen and the relief printing. You'll notice as I go through the talk that there is a thread of nature and um, what we would say natural symbols like trees and water in my work then, and this goes back about 16 years and what I'm doing now, which I'll show at the end. Um, I remember going to Kim's house once and one of her neighbors had a canoe leaning up against a tree. You remember that, Kim? It's still there. It's still there? Okay, <laughs> across from the lake. Yeah. And when I'm doing my work, um, it's not literal. It's not like I'm illustrating this. I see something, I process it. Sometimes it just stays in my memory for a period of time, and then it comes out in a piece of work. So that, the trees and the water, and um, and my work for about 18 years was very flat and graphic. Um, I also did a lot of work with flowers. Um, so this is one of the pieces. 
So I had the printmaking studio at my um, access for many, many years. We had three presses in the studio. So I was really spoiled. Fridays when I didn't have to teach, I could be in the studio printing or in the summer I could be in the studio printing. And then in 2018, I retired and no more printing press. Plus years and years of doing it was starting to have some effect on my body. Then what happens, I retire at the end of 2018. Before you know it, we have the pandemic. So all this great retirement and traveling and everything I was gonna do comes to a um, screeching halt. Also at this time, um, and I don't normally talk about my personal life, but at this time, my husband had a stroke and my mother was diagnosed with cancer. So this is a really negative time. No printing press, and I think that was like the hardest thing to um, come to terms with. Two ill family members and a pandemic, which I didn't even know what that meant. So I started doing these pandemic prints. And what, I'll explain how this came about. But basically, I think we sort of realized the pandemic was hit, hitting on us in March. That's when we really realized something's going on. So I started doing these prints and as I finished them, which could be 60 days or 90 days, it took a while, I would number them pandemic 90 or pandemic 95, the amount of days since the pandemic started that I finished the prints. Um, I carved this black squiggly block, that was one of the blocks, and I carved a floral plate. So all the flowers that you see there. And I had printed that pink background on a lot of paper before I got lost access to the press. And I started combining this combination of something really negative or difficult in the black lines and something sweet like the flowers. And the more that I worked with the flowers over a period of time, the more I realized that flowers really have two connotations for me. One is something that you get on birthdays, you get flowers for anniversaries, you know, happy occasions, weddings. You also send flowers many times for something like a funeral. So flowers can be sweet and positive or it can be negative or difficult, let's put it that way. And I spent about three years just coming up with these combinations of these wiggly, squiggly lines that had a lot of um, energy and these floral motifs that I was starting to hide and diffuse. I also um, was exploring a lot of artists because I had nothing to do. I was like stuck in my studio for 20, um, 2019, 2020, 2021, that whole period of time. And one of the artists I found was Ying Li. I don't know if anybody has heard of Ning Li. Do we have anybody who, <laughs> no? Okay, so she is a Chinese artist. She teaches at Haverford College and all of her paintings are in oil and they're plain air. So she drags these huge canvases outside with all her paints. And sometimes she says, you know, she'll set up one place and start painting and then decide that's not what I want. And she'll move to another place with all of her paraphernalia and I just this is a close-up I just love the gushiness the thickness of this paint um the other thing I realized when I started putting this talk together is how so many things in my art career and life have juxtaposed have appeared have reappeared so when I was at the New York studio school I re um addressed the artist Frank Auerbach and then during the pandemic, I started looking at his work too. And anybody familiar with Frank Auerbach? Good. So he would paint in his studio all day in oils. And at the end of the day, he would scrape it all off. So all this paint was on the floor of the studio. And then he would do it the next day and the next day till finally one day when he put it down, it was what he wanted. And that became the painting. Um, and again, very thick impasto, brilliant colors. Um, I don't know that this piece is that indicative of his work. He does a lot of figures, but he also did a lot of um, street scenes of London. Another influence who I've always loved is Betty Woodman. I saw her work um, at the Locks Gallery in Philadelphia many times, and she is both a 
was both a ceramics artist and a printmaker. So the mark making, the color, I could relate to this really, really well. And another artist that I found during the pandemic was Chuda Kimura, who is a Chinese artist. Um, I just love his landscapes. There's not a lot about him, but um, everything I can find, I just digest. Um, I, I always put this kind of text up there just to help the audience. If you are a visual learner, not an auditory learner, um, you can follow along with this. But I do use sketchbooks a lot. I make my own sketchbooks and um, you'll see some images from there. But I found that a lot of the things that are in the sketchbooks do not relate when they're made larger. You know, they look really tight and well composed at four inches by five inches, but they don't necessarily translate to a larger piece. Um, I do something that Joan does, which is put small pieces of paper to see if I need another color. And you'll see that in one of the images. Um, now I'm trying to make these decals. So I'm actually putting pieces of print in water and the oil paint like peels off and then I can put those on the canvas. Um, another way of working. Um, I'm striving for a place in the environment, as I said, not a rendering of the environment that I'm um, trying to work with. And I think everyone who's seen my work will say that color is a dominant force. I don't know, I always told the students, if I don't teach, you'll see me in Home Depot in the paint department, because I just have this innate skill of being able to mix any color. And I don't know how to market that other than maybe making paint in Home Depot. But, um, right now I'm exploring the garden and um, flowers as more or less a metaphor for these life cycles. You know, you reach a certain age and life cycles seem pretty important. <laughs> Um, so this is one of the um, pieces of my sketchbook, and I really like this little piece, but I just don't think it would make a strong painting. Um, it's collaged of several pieces of um, prints. So in, was it 2021? When did we have our show? 22? 22. 22. Okay. Kim and I um, had a show at HCC, and it was titled Driven from the Garden. And I started um, finishing those pandemic prints. And again, trying to have flowers that both, both appeared and disappeared. And many years ago, I found this poem called Malik's Garden. And I had done some etchings with that title. And I have no idea where that poem is or who wrote it. But there was some poem about Malik's Garden um, flowers growing up in like cities between the cracks of the concrete. Um, so I titled this piece, Malik's Garden. And you can still see um, some of, in the upper left-hand corner, some of the print of the wavy lines and then some of the flowers that are obscured. And I did about 15 prints for the Driven from the Garden series. It's a combination of silk screen and block printing. And I printed one block over another. Um, this is a close-up, and you can see how um, different layers show through. I really like that idea that it's multi-layered, that it's just not as flat graphic as my earlier pieces. Um, this piece is in the faculty show, In a Dream I Was a Flower. Um, I felt it like really started to, to hold together, the combination of the flat shapes and the flowers. So when that show was done, Lynn invited my printmaking group, 24 Hands, to have a show at Broker Creek. And we had this lovely picnic and we each picked something from Broker Creek that we would work on. And at the time, the irises were blooming. So I don't know how many iris prints I had made. I had worked for about a year and I must have done 15 or 16 iris prints. And I carved multiple blocks and I started printing one block over another block. And that's where I, the color's a little off here, but um, yeah, the, what's yellow is really much greener. Um, yeah, it's like a lot of the color scheme here. I, th I think it's the um, color yeah. translation and the projector. Oh, okay, I had this in class yesterday. It'll, um, it'll show in the recording okay. much more clearly. Yeah, because the violets are against more of a chartreuse green. So here was another one. And then 
what I find is if I stick with something long enough, I tend to get to another place. I can't say I want to be at that other place. I just have to let it happen. So I was printing so many layers of the iris prints that it started to abstract. And then I really started to like the prints, even though I was getting tired of the iris. I, I liked the idea that it's breaking apart and becoming less literal, it wasn't becoming as much of a flower. Um, here are a few of the sketches I did. I went back to Brooker Creek. I did more little sketches on site, um, some collage. But again, it's just to record ideas in my mind. I wasn't going to make a literal translation of this. And the flowers became a little more landscape oriented <laughs> as I worked with them. I'm sorry that the colors are so yellow because they're really not. If you look at the pieces in the show, you'll see they're, they're not. Um, and this was the last um, iris print I did. And you can see that little piece of purple paper in the upper left, it's actually purple, not red. Um, Cause I think I had needed one more iris over there, but that's what I would do. I would put these little pieces of color aid paper up there and it could stay for weeks. I just don't know. I don't know what it needs. It's not telling me. I just have to wait until the piece talks. And um, then I was done. I was done with it. And I was done printing irises. That was over it. Um, so I this is from linoleum. I carved a large wood block, which has a different um, sensibility. The marks are a little rougher. And this is a really big block. I'm talking, <laughs> but it's really big. And I showed, I sent Kim a picture. I said, it looks like wallpaper. Do you remember that? You were really nervous about it. Yeah, that. I did not like it at all. So I silk streamed some colors on the paper. Then I printed the block and I started being happier that it was getting diffused, that it was becoming um, more worked. And then I found something that now I have to go to the 12 step program. I found oil sticks. <laughs> so I bought four oil sticks of Blick and I had a good time. And now I have like 60 of these things. And I think they are gonna put a sign up. Do not let this lady buy any more oil sticks. <laughs> um, oil sticks, um, Leslie Nauman uses them too. And we had a really great discussion on it um, during her talk a few weeks ago. Um, but it's oil in a stick form with wax. And you can also manipulate it with mineral spirits or turpentine. So I got in there and I was really able to hide some of the floral imagery and um, let a lot of mark making happen. And this really shows you, um, because it's also wax, I could get in there with the back of a paintbrush and draw into it. I could take um, an uh, X-Acto knife and scrape it away. So I was really feeling like I was involved. And you could still see the flowers coming through, but it's more like if you drive by a field of flowers and they're in your head, but you're just seeing like a mass of color and movement and texture. And that was what I was going for. Um, this piece is in the show and um, it started out as just a piece on the right, just one square of print and oil stick. Um, and I thought it was too dense. It wasn't breathing, it needed some air. And I remembered when I was at the New York Studio School, I was 25 years previous, um, Graham had said, you can add paper, you can take paper away. I mean, it's not possible with a canvas, but we're not easily done. But I just added another piece of paper and I took the back of the paintbrush, dipped it in the printing ink and started drawing the flowers. And then I printed over some of the other areas and then went back in with the oil sticks. <clears throat> so I felt like at least I was giving the piece some breathing room. Um, after that, I found some drawings that I had done right after the New York Studio School. And this is called Russian Sauce, the um, charcoal that, have you used this Liz, Russian Sauce? It's really nice chalk, charcoal, but it has a little wax in it also. Um, and I had started doing these um, little drawings of um, Hidden Lake and other water areas. Um, and I, I really thought, okay, I'm gonna jump into this now. There's a little creek by my house, but this piece is, if you drive down Lutz Lake Fern um, in Lutz, there is a whole field of trees 
and a lot of water. It's really um, very marshy over there. And so this was the first one I did. I thought it was a little too literal. So I've been working with this. This is, um, you know, some of the um, later work that I've done in the last six months. And then I started feeling comfortable with it. The more I loosened up, the better I felt about it. Um, the top is really inky black. Um, so why is this doing this? Because it's it's the color drifting in the um, projector, but it shows up in the recording. Okay. Yeah. And um, some of them are really dense like this, lots and lots and lots of oil stick. And these take weeks for me to work on. I just, I have maybe 20 of them up on the wall and I sit in my rocking chair and I just look and then I might stand up and put four marks on it and then sit down again and it could be another week before I touch it. Um, but I'm just trying to remember what it was that I saw at this little creek by my house um, and record that instead of um, literally describe it. Um, this is one of my favorites because it really, this one went fast. I was able to just make the marks. The trees were there, the, the water was there, the uh, ferns, there's lots of ferns that are around the water. Um, I was able to just lay it in there in about two hours. That's like a gift when that happens. And this is the last piece that I've done. This is much larger. This is about 40 by 60. So I'm able to work larger now. Um, I don't have to do additions like printmaking. And um, I think I'm having fun too. I think that's, which is a really nice thing after the angst of the pandemic prints. Um, I think I'm having fun with these. Um, I, re I read a quote a, a few days ago that I thought was really interesting. Um, the purpose of an artist. Um, and an artist is to make the familiar new. So like looking at a creek or trees, make it new and make the new familiar. I thought that was a really good summation of what we do as artists. Thank you. So are there any questions? <laughs> yes, John. Um, do I understand that when I see a brown dark, your dark being a brown color, in the reality it's black? Yeah. Um, Everything that looks this, brown should be black. Yeah, this one's pretty close to the, I mean, it's much closer um, to the real. I don't know why the projector does um, yeah. some colors differently than others, but this one is pretty accurate. Okay. Some of the others, yeah, it's black. It's okay. like an inky blue black. Yeah. yeah. Any other question? No? Well, thank you. Oh, uh -huh. Lynn? So how large would you like to Really large. Would you? <laughs> yeah. I could see a mural. Uh, maybe, but um, I'm, I'm transitioning from paper because it's so expensive to frame everything to um, wood panels. And then I want to see if I can do it on canvas, if it takes it the way I want it, if I sand it down and gesso it really smooth. Um, with the wood panels, there's only so large you can go because they're so heavy. But yeah, they have to be bigger. They have to be bigger. Yeah. Yes, Liz? Um, a couple of things. Uh, feeling like you're, you know, going to make the painting. So what's the, what are the advantages of doing that? I guess you get off the paper and you go on to a panel or you go on to a canvas or something. And I was wondering, would you consider a canvas? And even if you didn't like the surface, there are things you can do to flatten it make you know grind it mm -hmm. prepare that would it'd be lighter you know yeah well the reason I started with the prints was um because you can make multiples and so I have a gallery that I've been working with in South Carolina for about 25 years now and so it was great you know I could sell maybe six out of the edition to her and um it, it was a good money maker it was it was really good I could sell them at an affordable price and um I had an outlet and I had the printing press, but now I don't see, at this point in my career, I don't see the necessity to make multiples. Um, and so I'm, I, I'm go I did paint prior to, to doing some printmaking, 
So I'm, I'm going back. I'm just going back. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because I followed your career for a really long time. And when I first knew you, you were, I knew you as a painter, not a cooking girl. And, um, but what's also interesting is that New York school experience, you know, you've always held on to this desire to keep making those marks. I mean, I, I think this is a pretty interesting way of going. You could work on lighter Oil, so. Yeah, I, I can. But like, like I'm, this is a brand new, I didn't even know they had these oil sticks. I mean, you know, oil pastels, but I wasn't familiar with this. I'd worked with um, Williamsburg oil paints many years, and I love that. But this is totally different because I can draw, I can incise. Um, it just says it has a real physical quality to it that I really like. Are they water based? No, they're oil based. That's, 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 that's yeah about the oil sticks i've used them but you always have to keep the tip of them from getting hard you have to yeah um it, ziploc bags <laughs> ziploc bags. yeah okay. you take them out of that it took me a while to figure this out you take them out of the plastic tube you put them in a ziploc bag and they stay okay hard. yeah, yeah. That's yes great. um during any of the this process of creating this piece, the pieces, do you use your fingers at all? No, I don't usually use my, yeah, to try to I mean, be somewhat, you know, neat about it. <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah, Lisa? I, my father used pastels and he used to yeah. stick yeah. mm -hmm. The paint sticks, is there a resin, the more resin than the red well? I don't think so. I haven't looked at the chemistry of them. Um, so I, but I know that there's other things, people who do encaustic, like Leslie Nauman uses them, and you can add them to wax and um, I'm just drawing with them. And I'm also putting them on a glass palette and adding mineral spirits and painting with them with big brushes. So I'm using it more like an oil paint. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming by. Yeah, stop. 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 Stop.